Thanks for having us. So we figured we would go around and introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about the work that we do, and then I'll kick off with questions, which I'll read from my phone, so I'm not Snapchatting. I'm actually reading the notes that I wrote. Um, so I'll pass it to, well, first, I'm Mike Swartz. I'm a partner at Upstatement. We're a design studio, design and engineering studio in Boston. Um, we build things in WordPress um, sometimes, so that's our connection to work Um And I'll pass it down to Jen for introduce yourself. Um, I'm Jen Ecker. I am co-founder and creative director at Shines and Jecker Labs. We are a web design and development agency in Portland, Maine. Um, we've been in business for eight years now. We mostly work with WordPress, um, so I do a lot of design, work with a lot of designers, and also work with a lot of agencies who give us designs. So I have a unique perspective, and I uh, have a lot of hats. I use the tiny mic. Uh, hi, I'm Mel Choice. Uh, I'm a designer at Automatic. I mostly work on product design uh, for WordPress.com, doing uh, user experience and customer design. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Nate Sprague. I work for Imagine. Uh, we're a WordPress development company with an office down in Florida, and our headquarters up here in uh, southeastern Mass. Thank you, panelists. So, uh, in my role as the Wolf Blitzer of WordCamp, I will be. Um, I want to ask you all a little bit about uh, the work that you do and talk a little bit about the role of the designer in your studio um, and how it works with you know designer as front end developer or designer working with back end developers. Just so we can set the table a little bit here uh, for some of the conversations we'll get into, and you all can know like what sort of questions to direct to the panelists and kind of where we go after that because we're going to open this up for Q and A at some point. Hey, Rachel. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll kind of get into it. So, in your studios, and maybe whoever wants to take it can kind of raise your hand, what is the role of designer like? Um, so, it, where I work, um, if we're doing the original design for a client, because sometimes we will do soup to nuts um, websites, often um, I will be the principal designer and I have a background in code, so I'm fortunate enough that I design in the browser. Um, my specialty really is um, using CSS, so I'm able to sort of skip, you know, maybe more traditional design techniques like using Photoshop to start. Um, and, but it, a lot of times we work with clients that may have an internal creative team and they have ideas about design that they want to implement or we work with a lot of ad agencies and design agencies as well, um, being sort of their, their digital support side of their business that they may not have in-house. And so quite often um, we'll get like, you know, static comps of designs that then I will have to turn around um, and turn into code. Um, so it varies. Um, we do hire some outside designers quite often to do some print stuff or do identity work, um, but um, you know, it really can depend on um, what the project is and what, what the client's needs are for it. So at Automatic, uh, it's kind of funny. It's, um, it's really down to the individual designer and the individual team, uh, since we have a lot of teams that do different projects. Uh, so I mostly do uh, design uh, up until some like light prototyping with like HTML and CSS, maybe a little bit, bit of JavaScript. Um, but I I do a lot on the everything up until that point, and then I hand off to the developers on my team to build. Um, so it sounds like I'm a lot more like Mel here. Um, at Imagine, our production department is pretty much composed of the PMs, the designers, the developers, and the content people. Um, so it gets the designers first. Um, we design a home page all the interior pages, any sort of special pages that they might need. Um, once the site is pretty much designed fully, we kind of hand it off to the developers and the content people. Um, at that point, you know, there's a lot of back and forth, there's kind of shoulder tapping, stuff like that, but mostly the, um, the designing is, is pretty much done at that point. So now we can kind of know like, what design looks like in each of your organizations. What are some of the challenges you face as designers? And that can be with colleagues, with WordPress itself, uh, with clients. Um, so what are you kind of dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, Anyone? Let's see, I can address that. Uh, so we work with um, a lot of healthcare, um, tech companies, B2B, manufacturing, and a lot of times um, 
especially in like manufacturing, there's some some old old school guys there that they don't really want anything pushing the envelope. So it can be tough um, trying to guide them into you know really cool fun design that's going to be different than what everyone else is doing, um, but also kind of giving them what what they need and want on their site. So I feel like the biggest challenges that I have is, uh, am I designing the right thing? Uh, and is what I'm designing better for our users or worse? Uh, so we do a lot of testing. We do a lot of A-B testing. We do usability testing. Uh, mostly usability testing on my team that uh, I am doing. Uh, and then our developers take care of the A-B testing. And then we have people who can analyze the results because I'm really bad at math and the numbers. <laughs> um, so that I feel like is like my biggest challenge, like making sure that the work we're doing is actually like impacting uh, the people who are using uh, WordPress.com. Um, so I would say there are a couple of challenges that, that come to mind. I guess the first challenge would be to sort of try to talk clients out of things that we don't want them to have. Um, for example, like sliders, I really don't want them to have homepage sliders. Um, Talking about the fold makes me crazy, and clients, I have clients that understand the concept and they'll still say, well, I know there's no fold, but I really want this image to be above it. And um, so I think trying to educate clients about best practices and just because something you see everywhere on the web doesn't mean that it's a good idea to implement it on your site is a challenge for sure. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is recently we've definitely been working with a lot of startups. Um, and sort of like with a long-term relationship and the initial phase is, well, let's just pick a pre-made theme and get it up there so we can, you know, get um, our website up and then we'll talk about, you know, more sophisticated branding, um, you know, a custom design. And I just think it's really challenging sometimes to find a theme that is well done for performance. Um, there's so many themes that try to do everything for everyone and you know, they look great in the showcase, but you know, quite often clients don't have that kind of photography, or there's way too animate, too much animation on themes quite often. Um, so I think those are just a couple of the challenges that that we experience day to day. So that's really interesting. There's there are three things in there that I want to dig into. And as designers, especially if you're in a consultancy, you kind of have two bosses: your client and your user. Um, sometimes they're not on the same page, and they don't know it. Um, so I kind of want to ask about the, the client first, and then we'll dig into some of the user stuff. And the third thing was performance, which is really interesting. Um, so as designers, when you're working with clients, whether that's an internal client, like your art director or something, or an external client, like the CEO of the, the saw mill that you're doing a website for, um, how do you get your client to trust you, and how do you communicate uh, best practices, like Jennifer was saying, and you can tell them all day, I don't want you to use a slider on your homepage, but how do you actually help them understand that, and then trust you to solve it? Um, so I would say, first of all, trust, I mean, comes pretty early. I, having a nice website, having, um, you know, just trying to have some sort of credibility to your, your business. Um, and then when you meet with them, being personable and being honest with clients and saying, I, you know, I don't really think that's a good idea. Um, quite often we've talked clients out of bigger projects because it did not make sense. You know, they wanted to have an a iPhone app and Know, that just didn't make sense for the business. Let's talk about that later on. Um, so I think, um, you know, just being honest with clients and then also having a good portfolio and then just talking through why are you making these decisions. You know, the reason we don't want to have a home page slider is because there is a ton of research that people don't pay attention to it. Um, and just, you know, sort of backing it up with being informed and having, um, you know, a reason for saying it besides just saying, Yeah, so ideally, by the time the project gets to you, you know, your sales guys you know, have really talked you up and <laughs> letting the clients know that you know what you're doing. Um, so beforehand, knowing that you're the expert and having them listen to you and always having you know, a reason, like you said, not just saying, oh, well, I don't like that color. Uh, <laughs> um, having something to back up, you know, informed decision, uh, all that can help the client get, them, get the site to where you want. 
Uh, and also to add on to that, I agree with, with both of those, definitely, uh, is if you do have a disagreement, uh, to test it. So, you know, usability test it, or uh, like A-B test it, or any other kind of testing. Just get some sort of data, or like anecdotes from like real people that like, actually, you know, this thing, maybe it didn't work, maybe your client was right and you were wrong, which like totally happens, or, you know, maybe their bad idea, you tested it and it was like really bad, and then you can be like, hey, you know, didn't work out too well, you know, let's, let's try it my way for now. So, so much of a successful project is, is project definition that we were talking about, making sure you're solving the right problem, and sometimes clients come to you with one concept of it, they want an iPhone app, and you say, you don't actually need this. Can you think of any times when you've kind of had to manage up to the client if they've come with a specific challenge and you had to kind of uh, inception them with the good idea that you want to, uh, to design or build? Uh, so I have, uh, um, when I was doing a little bit of agency work, um, so I used to do, uh, I did an apprenticeship with Fresh Soil Soil. They're an agency in uh, Watertown. Uh, I did their apprenticeship program. Uh, and we had a client that came in and they had a like health app and they wanted to, um, they wanted to have like a freemium model. Uh, and so we did a lot of, we did like a two week, uh, two week research sprint on it to see if uh, like a freemium app would work well for them. And uh, researching, we determined that it was actually like not, it wouldn't be a good idea just because like what they sold was very similar to insurance. And so like a freemium kind of product requires a lot of uh, initial investment from the user. So like, you need to use an app a lot of times before you're like, oh, you know, this is worthwhile enough for me to want to pay for it. But if you have something that's more like insurance, you like to pay for it once, or you pay for it like yearly, and you don't worry about it ever again. Uh, and it's there when you need it. So we put together this kind of case study based on our research uh, that was just like, you know, you should do, you should just have people pay for it upfront. Uh, and uh, I think that's what they ended up going with. Really smart. Uh, <laughs> Researching is really good. Yeah, uh, it works. Totally. Um, so let's let's kind of pivot a little bit and start talking about uh, users and you know, user centered design, which is something we try to practice at Upstatement. It's kind of here as a designer, you can be an advocate for the user and for user experience. And you mentioned performance smell. That's obviously a huge part of the user experience. Um, so can you speak to how you design with the user in mind, um, whether that's performance or that's um, just putting things where, where a user expects to find them and how you might determine that? Anybody? Um, so definitely for, you know, user is um, really important to think about and I think performance is one of those things of just being responsive. Um, you know, responsive is sort of the has to have nowadays, um, but sometimes I think, you know, it can be an afterthought, but it's really important and so many people are using their phones to make sure are all, yeah, are all the information um, accessible on the phone? Are all the menu items easy to use? Uh, I think that makes a big difference. And um, I think performance definitely, um, especially with websites that have a lot of images or really a lot of large images, I think a lot of times we're spoiled. Um, having really good Wi-Fi, we're very fortunate. Um, it is. A lot of people don't, um, and so thinking about your audience and who's going to be coming to your website, um, and then what kind of connection are they going to be on, um, can inform, um, you know, how much how much do you have for photography or maybe um, your web fonts. Um, you know, are you loading them on your phone or how are you designing your site? Are you using system fonts? Um, so I think not just thinking about how maybe they might be interacting and, and getting content, but like where are they going to be using it? Um, are they going to be on the go? What's going to be most useful for them? And um, you know, also I, one of my big pet peeves, especially on mobile, is when you go to a site and it doesn't have the same information as the regular site. Um, that makes me crazy because I'm probably there to find out something that I would want to on my desktop. Um, so just keeping that stuff in mind, don't hide stuff from people cause, just because they're on their phone. Speaking to just the user's experience, getting them to where they need to be on the site, um, that sort of stuff's kind of happening throughout the entire creative process, um, right from the get-go and the kickoff, um, where you're talking about you know, laying wireframing out the home page, um, site architecture, what, what pages are going to be up in the main navigation, all the way through to when you're actually laying out the interior pages, what CTAs are going to be on this page, where should they be, 
this content drives the CTAs that you want users to go to, what sort of links are going to be helpful. Um, so that sort of stuff's happening throughout the entire process from creative to build to content, all the way to delivery. That's awesome. Yeah, I kind of got it. I was in India last summer and uh, the networks are extremely slow there and the, I had like a, a burner that I bought at the airport and I was using the internet to find uh, directions and things in Calcutta and those my idea of web pages completely changed. <laughs> um, so, talking again about um, you know, with the, keeping the user in mind, have any of you worked with any of the, the kind of more modern um, design strategies, like creating user stories as opposed to uh, like long feature specs or things like that? There's a little bit about. I don't know if anybody in the audience is kind of doing that, um, working in more of an agile mode where you're kind of starting with user stories and turning them into designs versus starting with a long feature spec sheet, but. I don't know if anyone on the panel has any ideas about that. Yeah, I really like to look at features in terms of like flows, like how somebody goes through an entire process. So if you're designing some sort of like posting interface, like what's the first thing you need to do? Like what happens after you know after they publish? And look at like the whole thing holistically instead of like you know these are the features that we need to include in this new thing, uh, and that way you make sure also that like you don't miss anything. If you're like thinking about the entire flow from beginning to end. You don't get like 90 way, 90 percent of the way through the project and realize there's this like other feature that you should have included, and now you have to like rush to like get it in before you launch. Yeah, um, I, you know, if we don't do stories per se, but definitely we're doing wireframing and um, sort of just mentally, um, when we're doing wireframing. We're sort of thinking about like what what problem are we trying to solve and what what question are we trying to answer for the user, you know. Why are we putting this button here? What's going to happen when they click it? Um, is this too many clicks for people? And just sort of like mentally going through um, and thinking about, um, you know, if I were the user and I want to, you know, buy a new garage door, what is my first step? What questions am I asking? And then go from there and try to figure out, um, you know, what the steps are to make it easy for them to get the information. So I'm trying to figure out where to go next here. Um, so I, I figured at some point we should talk about WordPress. <laughs> um, so assuming you're all work, you all work in WordPress, um, how how does that affect your work as a designer, and how do you also think that might change with things like the the REST API emerging, where WordPress becoming more of a content store and not the entire kind of theme engine itself? This is super exciting. Uh, at WordPress.com, we're like redesigning our version of WordPress uh, using the REST API uh, and React, uh, which is a JavaScript library. Uh, and so, a framework, whatever. Um, it's been really cool. Like we've been like actually like redesigning the way WordPress works. Uh, and so it's it's been like a very big challenge. But that's the kind of stuff that we're going to be able to do with the REST API. Is not only are we going to be able to make more dynamic client sites. But you could also make your own WordPress. So say you wanted to make like a, like a photo blogging app. You could use uh, the WordPress REST API and then design your own mobile interface. And like, like boom, like it's using WordPress, but it's something totally new and exciting. Uh, so that, I think, is, is really fun coming up. Um, so I would say for designing with WordPress, um, which most of the sites that we do are in WordPress, but we do do some sites that aren't. Um, there's always, you have to keep in mind that there's default templates that you're going to have to do some sort of design for uh, that just come with every WordPress theme. So, um, you know, maybe if you were building a static site or you're using something like Jekyll or you're just, you know, starting from scratch, you don't maybe have archive pages or things that you need to design for. Um, so that's something that we keep in mind. As far as, um, you know, the, the REST API and stuff, I think that will change for us might be, and I've been trying to do this a little bit, um, just because I always like to mix things up and do things different, is um, designing components as opposed to maybe designing a, just a whole page um, and just saying, okay, um, this is what all of the buttons are going to look like. Um, and I think, you know, something like the REST API where you're just maybe plugging things in instead of having just, you know, it's one page template. Um, will lend itself better to doing that sort of thing. So you just have this library of components that you put together on each page. Yeah, I think that uh, we are, we've been so template based with our themes and like moving towards uh, either some sort of JavaScript interface or you know whatever comes in the future. Uh, we are, I think, moving more towards componentizing things. 
So instead of being like, here's my page template, it's like, here's my header component, here's my widget component, here's my footer component, etc. Um, so my take on it might be a little different, only because our design process is kind of separate from our development process, and maybe it's this, just the selfish opinion of a designer, um, but when I'm, when I'm done with my designs, I sort of hand it off to development and say, do what you gotta do. Um, so as far as actually designing websites, um, I don't think my process is really gonna change much. I'm still designing websites. Um, so for the strictly designers out there, I'm sure <laughs> these things will stay relatively similar. Yeah, that's interesting. So it also makes me think of like the role of a designer, because some of the things that you're talking about now and Jennifer are more like front-end developer as well. So that's kind of interesting in our studio. Our designers are, are also the front-end developers, so we also have a different experience than most. Um, but I want to ask a little bit about the tools that you might use, or maybe a little bit of your workflow. Jennifer, you mentioned Wireframe, um, but everyone's kind of got a different flow. Like at Upstate, we kind of, designers can use whatever they want, like Sketch or InDesign or Illustrator, because it doesn't matter because they're moving it into code and that's not the actual deliverable. But I wonder if you could speak to that, because it might resonate with some of the people in the audience, like what your flow is going from Wireframe to Design to code. Um, so, ideally, I'll, sell, I'll say my ideal um, workflow because it's never ideal. Um, but ideally, we actually get all of our content from the client ahead of time. I really like to design with the actual content that the client's going to use because it's always different. Um, I spent a lot of years designing with Lauren Mipsum and stock photography, and my design looked great, and then the client took over, and it was terrible. So, I really like to know what I'm getting into with clients. Um, and then also they know exactly like how challenging it is um, to produce the content. So if hopefully we have the content, but um, definitely we're wireframing to sort of get some idea of like what the templates look like, what maybe some of the components in each section look like, um, and then um, and then I will just sit down and I design in the browser. So I start with CSS right off. Um, I definitely will take you know assets that maybe they have like. What kind of fonts do they have in their print material? Um, do they have a logo? Do they have um, you know color scheme that I need to work from? And then usually go from there. Um, quite often we will do two design versions and have the client look at two. Um, since I'm designing in the browser, it's handy because I can have the responsive um, views for the client to see. Um, so there's no need to mock up all that stuff like separately per se. Um, and I use CSS, but really I use SAS, so um, write everything in SAS, and I use run, which is the task runner that does all the magic for all that. Um, and then, you know, show the client, they'll usually pick one design and make a few changes and go from there. Um, so I always start with research first, and like figuring out like what are we actually building, uh, like what kind of problems are we trying to solve. Um, my favorite tool uh, is just paper and pencil, uh, so I do a lot of sketching in the beginning. Um, I like to do wireframes, and I like to like link my wireframes together just so you can get a sense of the flow. Uh, and I use Balsamic for that. Uh, it's my favorite wireframe tool ever. Um, when I get into um, like more polished mockups, I'll use Sketch. Uh, sometimes, if I'm working off of something that already exists, I'll I'll do like. Uh, I'll screenshot it and I'll like do like a composite screenshot kind of thing in Photoshop where I just like drag stuff around. Um, but if I'm doing something from scratch now, I do it in Sketch. Um, and then I lately I've been trying to do a lot more prototyping. Um, so I'll take my uh, mockups and I'll link those up uh, into Marvel, uh, which is a great like online prototyping tool. Uh, and then I'll pass those around to my team, uh, to other designers uh, for feedback. Uh, and then if we have the time, or if like we're really worried about it, we'll uh, actually try to test those prototypes. Which is, I feel like I'm still getting the hang of like testing prototypes versus like actual like finished things. Uh, and I'll pass that off to my team, and then I'll just check in with them uh, as things are being built. Uh, and then once we have something that's like working, we'll try to test it. Um, so our process starts with um, the homepage design. We'll do kind of a quick wireframe, just sort of laying out the different things that they want or need on their homepage. From that point, we'll take it into actual homepage design, where we present three unique concepts for our homepage, and they sort of pick a direction to go in from there. Um, well, 
might have a few more iterations on the home page and then we'll go into the interior. At that point, once the home page and a generic interior page are worked out, um, we'll sort of the next deliverable is actually like a working site. So anything else that needs to happen might happen behind the scenes where you know if it's a responsive mock-up, we'll just hand that over to the developer. You probably won't even show that to the client until it's actually a live site. Things like there was a e-commerce on the site, we might mock that up for the client before they get to see it on the live site, only so it's not getting built and all flushed out before they can see it. So things like that might be wireframe, but a lot of the interactions on the sites aren't really overly complicated. Like we're not doing applications or anything like that. So um, as far as like wireframing out know, whole work like flows through pages, we don't really do a ton of but aside from that. Okay, wow, okay. So there's only five minutes left, so we'll definitely open up to questions. Um, so, yes. I'll, I'll just bring the mic around, so I'll be at the runner for your next. <laughs> I was curious if any of you are using WordPress for wireframing from the beginning. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, so sometimes, especially if I'm trying to gather content, um, I will try to put a, uh, we will do some like maybe hand wireframing. A lot of stuff we do might be internal. It might not be, especially if it's a smaller project, we're always wireframing, but it might not actually be deliverable for the client. It's just, you know, a document for us to reference. Um, but I do like the idea of having a theme that is just a shell and then you can have the client go in and put their content in while maybe you're doing some other development or you're like working on the design stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great idea, and we do try to do that sometimes. <laughs> um, what do you use for A-B testing and usability testing? What tools? Uh, for usability testing, we use uh, usertesting.com. Uh, since we're all remote at Automatic, uh, it's easier just to do everything online. Um, but I have done some like really user testing before where I'll see if like people at my coworking space, I work out of a uh, work at Cambridge, uh, I'll see if anyone has time to like come test a thing with me, which is actually much better for prototype testing is to do it in person. Uh, and then I find usertesting.com is better if you have like a URL that somebody can go to. Uh, for A-B testing, um, we actually have like an internal tool that we built. Um, so when we have a site up, site up in staging, um, we install Bugheart on it and pretty much hand it around to our own team. We do a bunch of QA on it. We hand it over to their team when we know it's ready. Um, they do a bunch, you know, you can go through each page and bug each little problem that they find. So that's always a really fun process, <laughs> finding all the bugs. But um, as far as. Designing through stories. Okay, yes, question designing through stories. So, the, the way we think about um, feature definition at Upstatement has changed a bit over the years. So, it used to be the client would kind of lay out everything they wanted. I want so many pages, and I want commenting, and I want this. Um, but that's not from the user's perspective about what users actually want. It kind of treats the user as like just a lushy tentacle that's just clicking things on the web. Um, so, we try to think about what a user is actually trying to do. Um, and there's like a whole bunch of stuff about user stories, and it's really saying forming your your features as uh, from a user's perspective. So, as a user, I want to uh, provide feedback on this article. As a user, I want to sign up for this event. Um, there's also like a so that I can blank. So you're kind of talking about the, the value to the user. So that's something that that's really helped us um, working in more of an agile mode, so that we're not kind of designing these big shells of websites that are possibly flimsy inside. They're more um, thinking about what people are actually trying to do on, on the our site. Think about it as a tool with value to the user's life. Um, but anyone else have any thoughts or anything? Have time for two more? Yes. Sorry, my bad also. I thought that we had an hour. That was my mistake. Do you want to grab the second microphone right there? Yeah, it works. This question probably is for Jennifer. You had mentioned um, at the beginning about um, themes, about um, pre-created themes that you can buy. 
um, in performance. And I always struggle between if it's the right thing to do to develop a custom theme, which doesn't get the benefit of being updated um, as a theme that you will buy and continue to get updates. And then I guess the second part of the question is when you have gone the route of, um, so I'd like to get your thoughts on custom themes versus uh, purchase themes. And then also um, for the ones where you have done purchase themes, what, what do you find? Which themes have you found to be good? Um, because I am concerned about some of the heavy weight of some of the, the purchase themes. Yeah, sure. So um, if you're trying to decide between custom and a pre-built theme, I mean, a lot of times it comes down to budget. It can come down to time frame. Um, we not only develop sites, we also host and manage them. So, you know, when we build a theme, we're going to be responsible for the code. Um, so I don't necessarily build a theme and then hand it off and worry about that. If there's something that we need to update, um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's covered under what, what we're providing for the client. Um, you know, we don't write our theme from scratch. We use a starter theme. We use underscores quite often. Um, so, you know, that's a great place to start. And then a lot of times it's adding on some functionality maybe. Usually we develop custom plugins so we're not necessarily tacking on the theme. Um, and then, you know, then it's just the design that sort of lays over top. And very rare, I, I can't even remember any time anything has broken using that. Um, as far as, you know, finding places to get themes, um, there's a lot of great places uh, a lot of times I'll start on wordpress.org. Um, if you're using wordpress.com, there's awesome themes like already vetted for you. Um, but if you're having a self-hosted WordPress site, I'll often start wordpress.org um, and just read the reviews, look to see how many people are using it. Um, and then if you're going to buy a premium theme, like maybe on um, ThemeForest, I would say, just once again, like, you know, there's reviews, you can see how often it's updated, what, what is being supported. Um, the other thing to kind of like, I would look at personally is how many plugins are required. Um, we had a client, a small startup, they picked their own theme that they wanted us to sort of like set up really quickly for them and it needed 15 plugins and that just made me want to cry. So, um, you know, and three of them were rare variations of slider plugins, which was very sad. But um, so, just sort of like, what's the overhead? And you know, I think there's these, um, you know, a lot of themes that are really nice, really popular. They get great reviews. We'll say, you know, there's a 200 different site variations in here, which is great because you have tons of options. But then that means there's all that overhead because they've designed this theme to cover 200 different site variations. And so that's going to mean a lot of JavaScript, a lot of CSS um, that you probably don't need. So try to go simple. Try to have some idea of what you want for a theme and then just pick the bare bones um, and, you know, not necessarily like, all the bells and whistles. All right. Last question. Uh, so Todd. Um, going back to the, uh, to what we were saying about user stories, how does, um, what does design look like in a post home page world where home pages aren't usually the destination for the first stop? Um, how, do, how do you make sure that people who come in on a landing page to answer a story at the start, the user story that they have, um, continue on, you know, have, have access to all the things they need and all the things you'd like them to have? Sure, so the question was in a post home page world, as many people are designing websites. Uh, the home page is kind of very important to the boardroom, but not so important to users. Um, what does design look like? So we just did a, a project for WBR.org, which is actually powered by WordPress underneath. And there's uh, an API that sucks the content out of WordPress and feeds it into React. And when we started that project, the home page was the last thing we did because it was statistically ins insignificant. Um, and that was another to convincing clients as to why we're just designing your article page. Um, so we just showed them the stats uh, for how many users come to their page. And the way the user story kind of worked in that world was us users of WBR.org um, didn't come there saying, I want to read text. They wanted to listen to uh, WBR's content. 
So that was kind of a radical notion because their whole paradigm was like a news website. It was set up like the New York Times, but their entire value to their users was audio. Um, so we started with the use case of a user wants to listen to audio and they want that experience to be great. They don't want their browser to refresh when they click things. Um, they don't want to lose their session. They don't want to pop up or under or something like that. Um, so that kind of user story, the simple user story of I want to listen to WBUR's um, morning edition or something like that. I want to listen to one of WBUR shows kind of led us to design the player and the article first and then kind of move outward from there. I think, I think that's... Oh yeah, so um, so the question is a book that we could recommend. So we've been kind of getting into this more in our statement. I would recommend going to a class. We've been sending our uh, designers and developers to Agile training. We really like the kind of, um, there's a very simple book. There are two books I'd recommend. One has like a seal on the cover, balancing a beach ball on its nose. And it's like Agile, a breathtakingly short introduction or something like that. It's like a like a 24 page book that's very simple. And there's another one, and I'll try to post this somewhere online. Um, just referred to as like the color test book, and that's one that our technology director really likes. Again, I don't know the, the title of it, so I'll pass that one. I just know what the covers look like. But there, uh, there are books out there. How's that for a horrible answer to your question? Thanks, everybody. Thank you, panelists.